Waves and Transmutations. You are being connected with the Cosmic Core. Careful, the first step is tricky. You have entered a new level of consciousness. We are adjusting your frequency. Hooking up your psychic telephone. And blasting your heart with solar flares of love light. Welcome to the Cosmic Core with me, your soul sister and astral astronaut, occult priestess. Allow me to give you a tour of the Cosmic Core. A bit of a wrap to serve as a map. Coalescing Cosmic Consciousness, coming at you with a Darshan Disco Shakti Pot Sitar Eye, blasting sonar to your third eye, dancing with bikinis and bikinis, mystics and yoginis in the astral sky, waving at the shamans and the hippies as they drift by, understanding through love we never die. We are the Platinum Ray, the Diamond Codes, the Star Seeds, and the Not So Ascended Masters, souls of two worlds walking between them as best we can, perfecting the great work. We are beyond time, the hermits, the healers, the compassionate ones, the light warriors, mask rippers, and systems busters. We are missionaries from the upper realms, planting the seeds, anchoring the vibrations, teaching the way, unlocking DNA, cleaning up the bloodlines, clearing karma, and preparing humankind for the greatest show on earth. Earth. Occult Priestess reporting for duty. Given name, Corinne Wilson. Nickname, Kor. The Greek root of Corinne, meaning maiden. I am agent M-I-B. That's maiden in black. For more about me, see my page, occultpriestess.com. Last time in the Cosmic Core, we met Styx Hexenhammer 666, a.k.a. Tarl Warwick, the occultist and political commentator that's blowing up the Internet, and he was our first male guest in the Cosmic Core. Today's luminary may be weird, but he's no stranger to us. Welcoming to the Cosmic Core, Gnostic teacher, author, show host, the continually inventive and evolving Miguel Connor, our fifth guest. Number five equals Mercury. Miguel Connor is also widely known among his peers of modern occultists. Standing on his own, the work he has produced over the past 11 years speaks for itself. By association, he is among the big dogs of teachers, rubbing elbows with luminaries such as my favorite, Gary Lockman, formerly of Blondie and author of The Supernatural Song entitled, I'm Always Touched by Your Presence, Dear. Miguel has also written for Reality Sandwich, an online zine by Daniel Pinchbeck, the recent author of How Soon Is Now?, Miguel Connor's interview with the wife of Philip K. Dick, Tessa Dick, is not to be missed. You can find this, free books, videos, a detailed and artful blog section, and much more at Miguel Connor's website, Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, thegodabovegod.com. And now, as they say, on with the show, and we join these two occultists already in progress. If you got a way of doing things, let's do it. Excellent. My blueprint has been Freeman Fly. He was my mentor in that sense. Yes, yes. I was on there, God, I think it was a while ago, a yeah. long time ago. Yeah, man. So, yes, it was a good experience. So, yes, good, good mentor, that's for sure. Confession about me you might not know. I have conscious contact with my spirit guide, and his he's Hermes. Oh, interesting. That That's great. I mean, but Hermes is the god of the mind, and uh, he's also a trickster god, so watch out. <laughs> no, Hermes is great. Uh, god, he's one of, yeah, he's one of the great ones. Well, I know that you know him and that he knows you. Mm-hmm. And he was the one that set up this interview. <laughs> Ah, I figured, I figured. Yeah, whenever uh, I think of recovery, 
I have a term I said called finding Hermes. And wow. one day I'd like to do a podcast about recovery because again, Hermes is the trickster god and the greatest trickster is our mind, but it's also it is uh, at the end the mind is the path to God. It's tricky. <laughs> wow, let me know if there's any way I can help. I have not re uh, written a book on recovery, but I have been through it myself for codependency. And my father was an alcoholic, so I'm an adult right. child. Of course. I know my 12 steps. I'm a good girl. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, of course. Yeah, codependency, alcoholism, it's kind of hand in hand. Totally. I got the feminine, you got the masculine of it. Yeah. <laughs> to me, you are a Nordic, like, four, energetically. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, one of my best friends says that I'm stuck on the uh, Scandinavian energy, Jungian energy, because I'm always out to war. So uh, maybe you're right. But what is your bloodline lineage? Uh, my father was uh, second generation Irish. My mom was Portuguese. But uh, somewhere up the, up the line, there's a little Swedish blood. Hmm, how very interesting. And is uh, Cor how do you say your name? Great. Thanks for asking. You can call me Cor if you'd like. Okay. Oh, that's much better. Yes. Exactly. Because I know I'll forget. Yeah, Cor. Sweet. Because media mm -hmm. is difficult. You need to be a sound bite. You can't be the beautiful Corinne. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. I'm also going to start going by Mercurial Girl, the messenger. Ooh, I love that. That's awesome. I want you to know I'm fairly new to Gnosticism, I did read Elaine Pagel's book, mm -hmm. uh, The Gnostic Gospels, and I have John Land Lash and you, of course, and those are my three preliminaries. Those are my people that Hermes sent me to, to research this, okay? Like, over... <laughs> Five years, I suppose. Well, that's pretty varying. That is, uh, yeah, three distant corners of the world. That's what he does. You know him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How long has the Gnostic Radio podcast been on the air? Um, that is also not an easy question, like anything. It started out as a venture called Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis. And it was more of a educational, almost a lark, that I did for um, back in an atheist uh, network. And I just did it to do it, but uh, I was very blessed to have some amazing guests, even right off the bat. I had people like Bart Ehrman, Timothy Freak, and uh, many of the um, original translators of the Nag Hammadi. So I just kept doing it, uh, and uh, years later, um, I changed it to Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. This is sort of, uh, Aeon Byte was sort of a... Uh, you might say a muse, a personification of Sophia that I used to uh, lean on back when, even when I was a young teenager. So I named it AM by Gnostic Radio, and the success continued as far as uh, Gnostic studies in the esoterica. Uh, Elaine Pagels was on the show, so was uh, John Lamb Lash, and uh, many other wonderful guests. And uh, you might say only in the last few years has it become, you might say, a multimedia venture that you might say I took it seriously in the last three or four years, but all in all in different incarnations, it's been going on for about 11 years. And uh, here we are. I really don't know why I do it. I try not to question and I hope I made a difference and uh, woken up some people in the, in the whole process. Massive congratulations. That is definitely a calling that you heard and you went forth and got it done with Providence. I really appreciate that. So many people get the call, but they don't pick up that telephone. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. That Skype call and the record button. But uh, yeah, it just happened. It was way before the days of podcasting were even popular or, or accessible and all that. But uh, things just went on and, and, and it hasn't been an easy journey. I mean, any journey you take, obviously going to be difficult because any task is difficult. But when you're on the right spiritual path, in my experience, uh, the universe tends to throw some things at you and the universe tends to be very vicious at it. Mm -hmm. I guess we could say the Archons realize perhaps that people are waking up or you as an individual are waking up and they're going to they're going to challenge you. They're going to challenge you. They're going to try to break you. They're going to inflate your ego and they're going to do what life does best is make you your own worst enemy, something that I've been very good at uh, my entire life. But uh, it's been also um, 
a journey of growth, a journey of wisdom, and at the end of the day, a journey hopefully of uh, just uh, making a difference. Like Neil Gaiman said mm. uh, during uh, graduation, the best thing you can do in this world is leave it a little bit more interesting than when you found it. I don't think uh, you ha- going in trying to change the world and make a better world is almost like you're playing right into the hands of the Archons or the Demiurge. But if you create uh, good art, good content, and you make things just a little bit more interesting, you'll find you'll make, uh, or I have found, you make a very big difference. Yeah, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You don't <laughs> die with your music still in you. These are so inspiring. Uh, sorry. I kind of... Uh, Emotionally, you really send people for a ride. I think that especially intuitives hook into your energy field and you are a roller coaster. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, I never wanted to do like a point A and B. I wanted to, uh, as life challenges me, I wanted to challenge the listener, uh, inject it with a lot of humor and certainly with a lot of uh, darkness, a lot of edge simply to be uh, entertaining, uh, simply to stretch the boundaries, and simply to tell people that spirituality or religion or even philosophy, ancient history, it's not dull. It doesn't have to be dull. I saw these ancient people as the they were the rock stars of their time. They were the punkers, the outcasts, the comic book uh, geeks. And they were exciting. They were fun. They were dangerous. They were counterculture. So when I do my podcast, I want to tell people this vibe can work in today's uh, audience and their energy is still exciting today and perhaps even more necessary than ever. I 100% agree with you. And the journey that you have taken through podcasting is living mythology. Yeah, that's what I always like to tell people. um, Write your own gospel, live your own myth, because if you don't, The uh, powers that be will find a ghostwriter, and they will write a script for your life, and the script will be full of conformity, mediocrity, and forgetfulness. So it's better if you uh, take the the bull by the horns and create something. Again, make things more interesting. I think one thing the Gnostics were accused throughout history was they were always pumping out Gospels. They'd write all these Gospels about Jesus and Mary Magdalene and all that, and The church fathers got very angry. It's like it was a factory of gospels. But what they were doing is they were, again, writing their own gospels, and they were creating these great mythologies around their their leaders and their rituals and all that greater than life, from Simon Magus to Valentinus and so forth. And I think that's something to do that's important to do today. It's... uh, it's, a, it's the old fake it until you make it kind of thing. Sometimes you just have to walk this walk of art until you find who your core self is. So that's what I've, I've sort of tried to do. I mean, in real life, I'm pretty much just your average guy. I mean, you wouldn't notice me from anybody else uh, down on the street. And I like to do things like take the kids to the park or watch the bears on Sundays. But at the end of the day, like the ancient Gnostics, it's not so much what you do is the dangerous thoughts that you think, the provocative thoughts, those are the things that then manifest in different avenues and mediums that can really make a difference. I don't walk around and um, in sort of cosplay or something like that, but it, it's the ideas that change the man. It's the ideas that can change the world or at least challenge the world. Excellent points. I believe that you have given us a review that I'd like to hang on to with the mythology, the rock stars of the past. (laughs) And now I believe the reincarnations are here on the earth again, ready to write new myths, live new myths. How do you feel about that? Um, I'm not exactly following you. What do you mean by that, Cor? Okay. I know, (laughs) I know, so we can say we know things now. I know that I am reincarnation of Cor Persephone and that I had my own myths and spirituality back in Greece. Uh, And I came from Egypt before that. But many of us branched off from Egypt to start our own mystery schools through reincarnation. And we've been doing that for many cycles now. And I believe we're at a time of graduation, not to get too ahead of the curve, really, but that's where I'm at. Uh, Okay, yes, of course. Yeah, I understand. I, I don't have personally 
recollections of past lives, but uh, there are forces and archetypes and God images that speak to me. And sometimes that's as good as anybody. Obviously, I enjoy the myth of uh, Simon Magus, the myth of Hermes Trismegidos, uh, the ideas of uh, Sophia and the Logos and uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene and all that. So all of these speak to me. And of course, the Gnostic god Abraxas, the very mysterious god who like Baphomet, nobody really knows much about him, but he seems to be this shadow across history and is sort of uh, making a bit of a comeback in today. So these images, these archetypes, these symbols definitely speak to me. Uh, but again, I, do, I don't personally, I don't have much recollection of anything in the past. I do also think like from a Joseph Campbell perspective that today's stars or those we call famous are not really shining very brightly and it's like the past is shining through because it's more bright than the now yeah i would say so i mean today's stars of course the smart ones uh, and certainly the successful ones whether it's beyonds or jim morrison who called himself dionysus mm -hmm. uh, if they're smart they of course grab on to these ancient symbols these ancient forces these ancient magic and often their shows are very much rituals mystery really mystery ritual shamanistic rituals and all that so they know just like politicians do with their weird symbols and corporations they knew they know how to tap into the this powerful magic of uh, ancient times or the magic of medieval times and so forth although of course at the same time some of these stars and famous people are completely synthetic they've been built uh, from the top down from the bottom up to and of course uh, clothed in all these symbols and magic but uh, for the most part a lot of them are just very synthetic so it really depends Wow, that's a really great take on the plastic industry that we have here in Hollyweird. I'm in L.A., by the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look at somebody like Taylor Swift. I mean, she had an influence. She has an influential dad who's uh, manufactured her career. She knows how you know, she's uh, been groomed and used all the symbols. But at the end of the day, as entertaining as she is, uh, I was like watching a YouTube video the other day and they have like these engineers will take away the music and the backup singers of a live performance. And when you listen to, let's say somebody like Taylor Swift, you go, my God, she really doesn't have a good voice or that much presence. I mean, she's no, I don't know, Bette Midler or something, or something like that. So a lot of this is, uh, you know, it's, it's an illusion and it's, uh, it's whether you want to buy into the illusion and enjoy something and hopefully something will be sparked within you and something will grow within you that will make you reach to a higher plane. So, well, that's up to you. But uh, at the end of the day, it is a lot of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> that's exactly what Hermes would say. <laughs> <laughs> and the scanner darkly of course looking through a, ga a glass darkly yes yes old paul saint paul of tarsus the proto-gnostic and of course philip k dick's novel a glass darkly that sort of riffs off of that and that's uh yeah good point we will no longer see through a glass darkly when we wake up when we have that gnosis that divine knowledge that the ancient gnostics talk about that direct experience with an alien god beyond all the illusions of the material world please define for us gnosis gnosis is greek for knowledge and uh it, uh, it, but it's a special type of knowledge. Again, as I mentioned recently, it's a direct experience with something beyond all the material world, while also an understanding of the falseness of the material world. It is um, Elaine Pagels, who you've read, she talked about, she uses a, an, an example, I think, in one of her books. It's like, look, there's, a, there's studying France, there's studying Paris, and knowing the maps, the streets, and all that, but actually getting to Paris and also studying all the streets and all the maps, this experience and knowledge at the same time is very different. Gnosis is like that. You're not so much, you're, you are understanding the divine, but at the same time, you're experiencing the divine in an ecstatic nature. At the end of the day, Gnosis is, uh, 
it depends on the individual and is something that cannot be spoken. It's it's sublime and un, un, unearthly. So I say that basically is gnosis in a sort of spiritual tech. Although of course, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Of course, uh, again, it is different than other forms like enlightenment and so forth because your mind is always the the human mind is always active in the participation even as the soul is uh enraptured in these higher powers so and is also uh, repeating myself there is an understanding of this world a great example i like to say is uh for your listeners is uh basically neo in uh, the matrix the movie the matrix when he takes the red pill and he suddenly sees what he is he sees the real world sort of or the the matrix world sort of dissolving and falling down and he's in this pod he has had those first steps of gnosis he sees the horror of the world and uh, joseph campbell talked a lot about that life is horror you have to face the horror to wake up you can't just be in denial about it yes exactly life is suffering and that's that first part of gnosis but as um, neo goes through his adventure he begins to wake up further and see other things until he becomes, you might say, a Christ himself. A lot of the Gnostic texts talk about uh, it's not enough to wait till die and become uh, saved. Uh, they always talked about you must become a Christ while you are in this world, while you are in the flesh. <laughs> and eventually, as the, Gnost- as the Matrix movies progress, he becomes able to manipulate basically light. He's able to walk between the two worlds and all that. And eventually at the end of the trilogy, he is able to transcend everything and at the same time, hopefully help heal the world. So that in essence, I would say is Gnosis. Excellent. Thank you. I wonder if you've seen the painting of the ascending man, and I believe it is Sophia hovering over him and the artist, would have been Dolly, I believe, is the Ascension. Let's see, the Ascension of Christ. Yeah. Oh, of course, yes, yes. I think that's Sophia over him, that female figure. <clears throat> yeah, I think that would definitely be it. Uh, even if somebody made a case for the Holy Spirit, in ancient Christianity, the Holy Spirit was seen as a feminine principle, and they are Gnostic texts who actually equate uh, Sophia and... Uh, and the, the Holy Spirit, it was, again, the female side of God, the wisdom Kingdom. part of God. So this, uh, yes, now that I look at it, that would make perfect sense. This is a, a like a mandala picture. I had a, I had a vision during a kundalini awakening, which means I was definitely not in my body, of Neo becoming this Christ in, in the painting. And it literally, the, the painting came to life as Neo was lifted to the gates of heaven. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes, and of course, you can talk Neo, you can talk Osiris, you can talk Dionysus, you can talk, uh, again, these uh, great myths in which you have a, a king or a godman who must go through a great tribulation, perhaps die and be resurrected. And of course, there is always the divine feminine, the queen of the story who aids and assists them. Uh, obviously, you have uh, you have Isis and other figures, but... Uh, in Gnosticism, you would definitely have Sophia or Mary Magdalene or even Eve. That's something that people overlook. Is uh, I know in Orthodox Christianity, we've all been programmed that Eve was sort of this uh, meek person who came after Adam and so forth. But the Gnost- in the Gnostic uh, scriptures, she is a direct avatar of Sophia, and she's the one who actually gives life to Adam. She is the spirit of Adam who animates him and makes him into a whole human and she is uh, again seen as a very lofty figure and of course the whole idea with the serpent is uh, the gnostics had a completely different take in their gospels the gnostic was either a rep- was either jesus or was another avatar of sophia trying to uh, impart wisdom and wake up humans so they could get out of the prison that they've been cast into which uh, they saw well that's what the, that's how they saw the garden of eden I totally agree with that. When I've been bit, I, again, experience, when I've been bit by snakes in dreams, it's an infusion of wisdom, and my life changes drastically after that. Yes, I would definitely, yeah, I think that makes sense. In fact, God, you're right. I had a dream about a month ago, and it was uh, it was teeming with serpents. But uh, by now, I know 
in my dream work, a serpent, yes, it is definitely the ultimate uh, representation of wisdom. So it's in healing. So I'm all right with that. Yeah. And obviously Hermes is reaching out to you and there's the caduceus. Yes, yes, and there are Gnostic texts who talk about Hermes as the the wisdom provider, the logos, the reason of the God, and so forth. So they would have been, the Gnostic, ancient Gnostics would, of course, been very aware for Hermes, but uh, they simply uh, basically clothed them in in the figure of Jesus. I mean, they were both psychopomps, they were both the ultimate messengers of the, of the divine. That's what separates the Gnostic Jesus from the Orthodox Jesus. He's not there to die for your sins, but he is there to impart salvific knowledge, that gnosis, that awakening, that red pill. Yeah. And he's also there to help you travel up the heavens and the dimensions so you can find self-actualization and unification with the all. That's so true. And also, Philip K. Dick said that this rising Adam or Atman was all of us. We were all that ascending man. Yes, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, when uh, in these ancient, even in the Kabbalah, Adam is sort of a representation of humanity. He is uh, the collective of humanity, the Adam Kadmon. In Hermeticism, one of the third uh, uh, emanations of uh, the Monad or God is simply man. I mean, that's uh, that's a very powerful uh, motif that uh, goes through all. All esoteric religions in time, of course, and again, including the Kabbalah, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, and so forth. One of those golden threads from the golden fleece, no less. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, an archetypal uh, archetypal image that is uh, very universal and very useful. But unfortunately, we have uh, most of civilization has forgotten this, as they've forgotten so much more. But that's what uh, you and I are doing, Core. We're trying to bring that wisdom back in our little niche podcasts and so forth. Yes, to remember. We're signing up the members from the old times to remember, rejoin, and realignment, I believe, on a universal and planetary scale with the Galactic Center. Right. I mean, it's... Um what did Plato say? All learning is remembering. And he had a term called anamnesis, which Philip K. Dick used very much, which mm -hmm. is not remembering its loss of forgetfulness, because we all have that potential within us. We all have the universe within our minds, and it's simply about waking up and remembering everything. Yes, someone said we're gods in forgetfulness. Yes, I think that was Carl Jung. I think oh. he said uh, man is a, a god... Uh, suffering from amnesia, drunkenness, and forgetfulness, or something, or nightmares, or anxiety, and I think, uh, who was it that wrote, um, God, who wrote Ulysses? Yes, it was James Joyce who said, a man is a god in ruins. So, oh, my, wow. And, uh, and, uh, these, and these artists always sort of knew that we are gods. The Gnostics were a little bit radical, because in their text, they say, we are higher than the gods. The Gnostics just they weren't too fond of any god that was uh, dealing in the material world or was too close to the world or too involved in the world they wanted to go they wanted to go as far out as they could and so often they would uh, again say things like we are higher than the gods we are better than the angels and so forth so that's what something i like about the gnostics is they really were they really liked to take things to take things to the extremes they really were you might say the punk rockers or the rocks or the rock and rollers of ancient times because they were going to push the boundary as far as they could and uh, the result was yeah they shocked the world until they had to be um persecuted out of history if you would wow that brings up the templars the persecution somehow yeah and i mean i don't know if there's a connection between the gnostics and the templars but uh, probably the most interesting thing and i, I have talked to um, scholars of the templars uh, those that uh, they have no room for the sensationalism of the Templars. They have no patience <laughs> for anything that's uh, might be too fringe unless it's got a lot of, I mean, they're just not going to deal with it. But the one thing that they agree, the great mystery of the Templars is that, and this is a fact, I mean, this is a historical fact. We have the evidence is that one of the images that they used to seal their treasures was the image of Abraxas. Oh my goodness. So that is a great, why would these uh, pious Christian knights and bankers use a Gnostic god 
to seal their treasures, this very potent symbol of magic. So that's the one, um, that's a whole very interesting fact I have about the Templars. I love it. I'm really intuitive and just know things from the ether. So it's really great to have some facts to back it up. That's what we research for, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, it's, yeah, eventually it's good to have an intuition. And if we're patient, this intuition will become manifest or will be supported or we'll find other insights that will lead us to other places. God knows I've had intuitions that have been wrong, but I've trusted them. And they lead me to some other realizations that are great. But, yeah, the key is to have patience with our intuitions and see how they manifest. So we shall see if, if this lifetime or the next. And the rabbit hole, it twists and turns. It is not a one direction type of thing. You have to be flexible. Exactly. I mean, uh, if we buy into linear time, then we buy into the game of Saturn. And I totally if we buy agree. into the game of Saturn, then uh, we will end up death. His scythe will prune us like uh, like the wheat he so much likes to destroy. That's hot. That's really good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> from experience, from a lot of from a lot of mistakes. Nothing. <laughs> I guess that's it, right? Wisdom is sometimes uh, intelligence with uh, intelligence with experience. That does bring me to the next question: Is is the final outcome of gnosis the cultivation of wisdom? And what is wisdom, if that's true? The pearl. What is that exactly? <clears throat> well, the final. Uh, Purpose, I mean, as somebody very smart once told me, Gnosis is not the result, it's what brings the results. Mm -hmm. The experience is the ultimate result, and that really depends on the individual. But at the end of the day, of course, it is, uh, as Jung would call it, individuation, self-actualization, and unification with the source, the source of all. So that would be the goal of Gnosis. As for wisdom, um Obviously, I think the ancient Gnostics would have seen wisdom very much as uh, a representation of the logos from uh, basically the logos of Heraclitus, which is the, the reason of the divine, the creative, supporting, sustaining intelligence out there that brings harmony into the universe or at least harmony into the hearts of people is it so uh, is it in the universe of origin <clears throat> or is it outside the universe looking inward to us no um well i think that with the um with the stoics it would have been in the universe they were not uh, they weren't really dualists, if you would. Everything was part of one grand design, and that was fine. But for the Gnostics, it would be uh, from outside the universe. It would be an alien entity, if you would. And that's the wisdom that comes here. But and to the Gnostics, at least, the wisdom is fallen because... If humans are fallen and we are part of the Godhead, we have in each of the divine spark, as the Gnostics called it, then um, Sophia is fallen with us. And until we can all get out together or be unified together, here we are. So there are certain uh, aspects that the Gnostics saw that would have separated uh, higher wisdom and lower wisdom, just as uh, many people separate the, the human and the daemon and so forth. And in many Gnostic texts, uh, wisdom is not exactly a positive character. She's almost like a predator. She's very much like Kali. She's uh, on a path of destruction because she is going to, she knows that she is the fall, that uh, she is responsible for the fall of the universe in many ways. So she must fix it at all costs. And it's not, uh, probably not going to be a pretty sight. So that's uh, one of the many dimensions of Sophia. Interesting. So you see, you said from a Jungian standpoint, uh, individuation, self-actualization from Maslow, and we're talking about enlightenment, which is individuated, because in Buddhism there's two paths, there's a greater vehicle and a lesser vehicle. The lesser vehicle is, I just want enlightenment for myself so I can go home, thank you very much. And then the greater vehicle is the bodhisattva path of keeping in the reincarnation cycles as a teacher to help everyone, like you said, like the whole family come together at once, to, to come home at once. So it seems yeah, like the, the Gnostics are setting up a family dynamic where Buddhists give you a choice. 
Yeah, I think that good point because you did mention Bodhisattva. I think a, an apt description of the Gnostics, they really saw saw themselves as Christian Bodhisattvas. They had been transformed, they had tasted something greater, and they wanted to share that with the world, or at least those who are willing to wake up. So in that aspect, you could say it's, it, it is a greater vehicle. And in many, as the Gnostics were criticized for being world haters and surly and all that, in many of their myths, the, the highest reality is father, child, and mother. Mm -hmm. So they almost had this sort of uh, family-oriented aspect to their mythology. And their mythology, obviously, was them trying to explain existentially truths about the material universe. So that's interesting in the way you, you sort of compared it with Buddhism. Yeah, and I'm just looking at the dynamics and what they're doing to people as individuals through the people living their art through stories and which stories you choose to look up to. They're already within you, and it's as if you're being guided by your own mythologies. If you are gravitating towards Tara, the mother of the Buddha, that says a lot about who you are as a soul. Yes, that, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, honestly, Cora, I don't even know how to say it better. You, you hit it on the head. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Good. Love it. <laughs> Excellent. So what I'm looking at here is that you pointed out something I did not know. The Gnostics wanted to go beyond all the gods, climbing all over all of them, getting up into the stars beyond space and time. What was motivating them to reach beyond what anyone else was reaching for? <clears throat> what motivating was looking at the world. It's uh, very, uh, as Platonists or middle Platonists, they saw, they definitely did some uh, deduction of the world and they got tired of, uh, same thing Buddha got tired. They saw that the world was per was uh, suffused with suffering and they were done with it. They were suffering in human civilization. They were suffering in the animal kingdom. There was uh S seemingly an illogical arrangement to the universe. They didn't see the universe as harmonious, but they saw it uh, basically, a lot of them, the expression of a mad god or mad gods. Mm. And they felt that they were done with this. So the, the answer to them had to be to go beyond matter and to go to the realm of pure information. Of course, they saw sometimes maybe this information, maybe God or all the gods were crazy because they had lost their wisdom, mm -hmm. like Zeus losing Athena. You know, Zeus was never really himself after wisdom came out of his head. Mm -hmm. So they felt that there was a rescue operation of this universe, but there was also a repair operation. And they felt that humans could be part of this operation, but that meant these ecstatic journeys beyond the stars, beyond the gods, and to this, uh, well, they really, they called it an alien god, this uh, ultimate font of uh, being, this font of pure intelligence, this, uh, this great divine imagination. Now, today, when we say alien, we believe extraterrestrial, and of course, that does apply here. This god is not from Earth, but what did they mean by alien? By alien, that the world did not know this god, that humanity had spent whatever came around 200,000 years or so. Humanity had never made contact with this god or never understood this god. And therefore, this god was a, a stranger in a lot of the texts they actually called the manifestation of Jesus, they call him a stranger, or the, the Gnostic revealer of their stories, he's a stranger, ultimately an alien form that the world has never seen or experienced, and they had experienced this, but this form, this intelligence would always remain basically alien because it wasn't matter, it was pure information. And through what practice or psychedelic did they experience this entity? Well, that's what has been confused a lot of scholars <clears throat> for a long time and pretty much a lot of occultists, too, is that when you start studying the Gnostic texts or the historical accounts from the Church Fathers, you find that they had varied amounts of rituals. I mean, in Alexandria and Egypt, they were seemingly doing uh, sex magic. In uh, Rome, they were doing sacramental practices. In other parts of the world, they were doing contemplation. In uh, France, with Marcus the Magician, it seems they were doing psychedelics. So, so people are like, well, what, what's wrong with these flakes? <laughs> and I think uh, people have been couching or the couching or asking the wrong questions because it's not, it was never about the ritual 
we need a set of rituals to make contact with the alien god. It was more like you have felt that there's something wrong with the world. You have made contact with something better. So you as an individual or must find the ritual that can continue this gnosis, that can continue this ecstatic experience of the alien god. And of course, every individual is different, and all the Gnostic lodges were different, so it was a matter of finding the rituals that would increase your gnosis. So it's a little bit backwards than what most religions or faiths uh, pr you know, propose. So it'd basically be a core, you want to make contact with Sophia or the alien god, but you know what? What works for you might be Tantra, or it mm -hmm. might be meditation. Mm -hmm. But for Miguel, it might be psychedelics. It might be, uh, you know, praying to Allah five times a day. And sometimes it's mix and match. I mean, uh, for example, I uh, there was a there was a time I was taking meds. I was, uh, for the record, a manic depressant or bipolar. And it used to drive me nuts because I'd be like, man, these meds, they're, they're not going to last. This disease likes to shift. Uh, so what works today isn't going to work tomorrow. And I found out, I think with the Gnostics, it was the same thing. To be able to pierce the veil because is very hard, and the veil will shift around you like Philip K. Dick. The labyrinth is always shifting. So you always need to be on your toes and I think that's what the Gnostics were doing with their praxis. They were always changing their prescription and trying different things. Things didn't work. If things, if sort of the valve of mysticism stopped, mm -hmm. they would go to another lodge or add another experience or ritual and find it. So I think that's, uh, in a way, it's the richness. It's confused people for many years, but I think that's the rich, richness and uh, nimble ability of the Gnostics throughout history. Again, we bring up Hermes, always be on your feet, always be moving. That's right, swiftness of Mercury, which is about to go retrograde. Thank goodness we're doing it one day before. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. Uh, yeah, oh, my God. Well, <laughs> at least I know now. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure you'll have special good karma because you're doing this interview with me. But you have been called, so I don't know. You're, do you understand that when Hermes calls you, there's some kind of judgment going on with you, right? No, I don't understand. In fact, maybe that's what I'm here. Maybe you can explain to me more about Hermes. Maybe I, sometimes I don't think I'm listening. Wow. Well, you're definitely one of his students. Uh, he likes you as a person. <laughs> I know it's strange because he's my spirit guide and a god. So that's a little weird. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can see him as a daemon, if you like, like a, a demigod. We don't have to. He's He never claims to be the all one ever. He says, we, no, no, that would not, no. Yeah, we all I worship think. the All One, even him worships mm -hmm. the All One, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that one. I would definitely agree with that one. Probably because I've been focused so much on the Christian Gnosticism, I've sort of neglected even uh, his aspect of Hermes Trismegistos from the Hermetics. So I probably need to do a little bit, I probably need to uh, brush up some more on Poimandris and the Corpus Hermeticum and all that. I think uh, that's probably what this is telling me to an extent. Um, what I've noticed as a person, he's asking me to be honest with you, is that you're sardonic. <laughs> and you might say yes. all Gnostics are sardonic. Yes, yes. I mean, there is one thing, even when you read something like Thunder the Perfect Mind, which is this some have considered the greatest treatise on the divine feminine that's ever been written. Wow. It's a beautiful text. Uh, if your listeners haven't read it, they need to read it. And in fact, it, it was the it was the narration for a product commercial years ago that, of all people, Ridley Scott directed, uh, Mr. Occult himself. Yeah, that makes sense. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, God, what was the question? I got myself with Thunder the Perfect Mind here. Sardonic. Sardonic, yes. Even in something like that, there was something that the Gnostics did employ a lot was satire and parody. And they were they could be very sarcastic. I mean, they would mock uh, the Old Testament God like no tomorrow. They would uh, they would uh, subtly hit subtly hit the Roman Empire and the Greek traditions and other things. I mean, there were it was uh, it was part of their mechanism to stay sane in, in the world that in the world that they live. And in a way, it's something that I do today. Of course, I never mean to harm anybody. And if I do, I always try to apologize. I definitely don't think you're harmful, but you are offensive, and that's on purpose. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's sort of jolting. I mean, I'm not as offensive as some of the 
uh, blood and violence that you find in the Old Testament and other stories. But uh, I do like to use the the culture of the ages, stuff that you can watch stream on Netflix and other things to show the audience how uh, perhaps crazy we are or at the very least how programmed we are that we take some things for granted without seeing the, how ridiculous and at the same time how horrific things are and this can be manifested with music and sound clips and uh, just using the the language of the day most definitely and those are our tools the media is what we're going to take over the media you know that <laughs> yes 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 we must uh, we must because those who control the information uh, they control everything those who control the spy Control the universe. There you go. Information, spice, uh, analytics. Uh, it, it always changes, but there are those always trying to control. Most definitely, everyone wants to rule the world. And it was so interesting because Hermes brought up what is the difference between the world and the earth. It's okay in our society for someone to want to rule the world. But it's not okay for someone to want to rule the earth because the earth is alive. But what is the world? Is it dead? No, it's living. We're all alive. So there's a disconnect there. You see it? Yeah, and uh, interesting that the, to the ancients, for example, if you read uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew world, word for world or land is the same word uh, to the ancients there was really no separation they didn't see a difference they they had a more holistic view of the universe everything was connected everything had different layers but again there wasn't this separation of things everything was uh, it was a uh, was one flowing image if you would again we talked about saturn and linear time that's not something that they really uh, had to deal with and we have to deal with so sometimes it's better to sort of uh to yeah keep it connected exactly so i did have a curiosity that i think you could answer where are the essenes and the gnostics uh, where did they come into contact with each other, and why is Hermes in the Bible? <laughs> well, <clears throat> the scenes is a hard one. I don't have enough, or from what I've read, it's we don't have enough information to really make a claim, a factual claim or historical claim about these scenes. I mean, Josephus, the historian, talks about them and so forth. But we don't know that much about them, so I usually just try not to deal with them if I can. Mm -hmm. I just try to figure out, uh, try to work with the Gnostics and the Hermetics and other stuff. And, of course, the, the Bible, that's the interesting one, because we have uh, Paul and, uh, God, what was the name of the apostle he was walking with? Uh, Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, they called Hermes, because he was Bingo. the chief speaker. And then we got Romans 16, 14, and Acts 14. Exactly. And that is, of course, very interesting, because Paul himself, I mean, he Paul was out of his mind. I mean, when you read his letters, uh, not the, uh, f the false epistles and all that, you see this sort of uh, very uh, aggressive mystic who's basically out of his mind. He is trying to get into the mind of Christ, and that's what he's doing. And so, in a way, uh, you could see how he and Hermes would make sense together. And, of course, that story of uh, when they're talking about uh, Hermes and Zeus walking together, that's from an ancient Greek tale, which... Uh, Zeus and Hermes are walking around ver to, to see how wicked humanity is because they're trying to decide whether they're going to throw a flood on <laughs> the planet Earth. And that story, of course, gets taken in the Bible with, uh, again, the, it, well, it gets taken in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But instead of, um, instead of Zeus and Hermes, you've got the two angels walking around who walk into Sodom and Gomorrah. But some scholars have said that the, the flood story in the Sodom and Gomorrah just got separated. There were once one big story. So that's an interesting fact. And, uh, of course, again, yes, Paul and Hermes makes perfect sense. And devil's advocate uh, from the traditional pope-like Christian point of view that the Bible was written by God through people. How is it that God stole other people's stories? <laughs> because there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is the ancient myths. There is the world of archetypes and symbols going th hundreds of thousands of years back. So 
it would you can change the imagery and the clothing and all that but you basically have these primordial stories uh, we mentioned joseph campbell so we we know these stories are there so nothing new and nothing uh, yeah nothing new under the sun indeed and then you were talking about this sophiac myth of the the three aspects the trinity basically and where I'm coming from, Egypt, ancient Egypt, we have two sets of twins, and those what is what our teachings were based upon, and they're also based upon knowing that we are from Sirius, we are not from Earth. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that is interesting. I mean, obviously, the Hermetics took from the um, they took from the ancient Egyptian lore. Some scholars have said that they took a they basically. Uh, are the continuation of an Egyptian shamanism that then uh, you know came about in the first se- first and second century AD, and the idea of a, a twin, yeah, that's that's everywhere. Whether you're talking about the Greek concept of Socrates of the Adelon and the Daemon, or the Roman concept of the genius and the intellectus, or even the the Gnostic concept of the of the, the of the apostle and the Christ. I mean, those are all there in different uh, in different forms. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball because sure. our twins were not corrupted. So our twins were four principal selves or four principal teachings that came through, incarnated here to teach the people from the stars. So you have incarnated gods basically in early egypt i think it started before time started so i can't give you a timing on this and then those four teachings evolved or devolved for that matter into teaching more simpler terms because the daemon is also the soul or higher self of a person not a twin yes right would, yes of course yes right so you've got the two sets of twins, which are representing masculine and feminine in the dark side and the light side of duality or dichotomy that we have on Earth. Yeah, I think that makes sense. That's a very interesting, uh, yeah, that's an, definitely a very interesting take. I'm with you. Excellent. And then I see a, another generation coming forth through the teachings of Egypt and say maybe Moses and Akhenaten and a bunch of people branched off and created teachings around the world based on seed teachings. Yeah, that's definitely, that theory has definitely been put out there and it would make sense. I mean, obviously there are some theories that uh, that Moses and the Israelites never even were part of Egypt. They simply the lore was just uh, was just coming out, and uh, I know uh, there's some well, there's very interesting aspects. I like uh, a cherry s, my dear friend, who will have passed away two years in uh, December twenty fifth. She, in her book on Moses, makes an incredible case that Moses is none other than Dionysus. Wow! And if you look at the structure of his story. And uh, everything else, it is just, it is a complete parallel to Dionysus. Wow, and then we've got Serapis Bay right in there too, right, with those people. Yes, yes. So, again, it's uh, nothing new under the sun, and there are these archetypal images and stories and symbols that just flow in and out of history, in and out of characters. I mean, sometimes, you never know, sometimes you are in a place of history and these forces will wrap around you and it will recreate the exact story, some ancient story, and it will become true in that time. In your life, through your yeah, skin. In your life. You will be that God. You will be Dionysus or Hermes. I mean, sometimes and sometimes and this is not easy. I mean, the Greeks one of the fears of the Greeks was to be possessed by the God, because then all bets were off, all boundaries were off. And uh, basically, the structure of reality was going to fall down, and that meant the structure of society and your family was going to break apart. So it was nothing. It was it was sometimes pretty scary. I mean, there's that saying, "Whom the gods don't like, first they make mad." <laughs> and you wonder that's just part of the, that's part of the deal. I mean, Jung did say that the archetypes were quasi sentient; they had an agenda. Mm. And if you were part of their agenda in a negative or positive way, well, too bad. You're going to be part of the story they've decided. Very interesting, and not really a lot of room for free will there. <laughs> no, no, free will's a free will's a sticky thing. I don't know if there's much of a thing of a free will, but I know that we do have 
some agency when it comes to, uh, as I spoke about at the beginning of the interview, what gospel are we going to write for the world and what myth are we going to embrace? Uh, to an extent, we do have that free will, but once the door opens, then you've got to let what comes in come in. Well, it seems like all the fear and all the tragedy that you just described are simply losing the ego. Yes, that is. I mean, uh, the destruction of the ego is the beginning of reality or the beginning of uh, the, the journey back home. I and mean, what is what we've been basically, I think what the Gnostics and some other texts talk about, uh, we before we came into this world or in between lives, we our spirit or a divine spark goes through this factory. And these archons, the rulers of this universe, basically would not would construct not only our ego, but they would construct every point of our life, basically in the kismic kind of way, every negative thing, every disappointment, every failure. They would create the everything in our life was constructed already was already constructed so that we would become disillusion we would embrace forgetfulness we would accept conformity so it was a matter of there was that little wiggle room where the information of the alien god this great shining power could maybe get through one of the cracks because they assumed that again the universe was a machine and a not well built machine so some of the light might come in and wake us up where we could break from free from the bonds of uh, fate i mean and fate was uh that was something that terrified the Greeks and the Romans. I mean, you read it all in their myths from Odysseus and so forth. Fate was something scary. It was never seen as something positive. So it was a matter, could we wake up to the fiction that was this universe and see it as a story and perhaps, again, write a few better scripts to it, a few better uh, scenes? Yes, and through living it, the art, the mythology, through your own flesh, through incarnating, making that sacrifice, and living it through your own flesh, then that's what changes the world. Yes, definitely. I would say that is that is definitely one way to do it. So, but it is a tricky thing. I mean, I don't. Uh, I know sometimes it's so hard. I, sometimes I know I. I'm like, oh my god, I am doing stuff that I've been programmed to do, and it takes me a while to snap out of it. But again, uh, again, gnosis is knowledge. Understanding this is already half the battle understanding that you are being programmed that what you're doing is uh, not you or of your best interest uh, that's half of the battle right there yeah it's so interesting because what broke my paradigm of i am not my mother's daughter i do not have to follow what she did in her life i'm not her barbie doll <laughs> i'm my own person <laughs> was coming to the knowledge oh man i lost it hang on Huh. The knowledge that you were fake to begin with. <laughs> oh, was coming to the knowledge that there was something wrong with my mental processes. And I found that out when I found out I was codependent and I was led to the 12 steps and group therapy, basically. Yes, that's definitely very helpful. I mean, again, it was a matter of uh, like I tell people when we're talking about the 12 steps, it's, it's a matter of just uh, being honest, knowing you've been defeated, surrendering to something greater and uh, surrendering to a higher form of information that might liberate you. It's extremely Gnostic, and it has the humility aspect in it that I think Buddhism brings in very strongly. When you have a guru or a teacher, you basically lay your whole self at that person's feet because it's how much you trust them, and that's a humility that I learned personally in this lifetime. Yes, I would, uh, I would certainly agree. I mean... One story that most people don't know about the 12 steps is that uh, Jung what is part of the 12 steps. He's a big influence. One of the founders of AA, I think his name was Eddie, was, uh, or pre-founders of AA. He was uh, an influence on Bill W., or a friend of Bill W. Yeah. I'm not like a friend of him. Well, yes, he was yeah. an alcoholic, but he was, <laughs> he was a patient of Jung. He had... Uh, he had a terrible drinking problem. In those days, it was just, you know, drinking around the clock. That's what it was. And now we've got stuff like pharmaceuticals and iPhones and other steam. But in those days, basically, you drank around the clock. But um, he went to Jung, and Jung very much gave him a sort of koan, a sort of, or a sort of Buddhist take on it. Jung said, nope, I can't help you. 
And Eddie was like, well, what do you mean you can't help me? You're, you're Carl Jung. And he said, no, in my experience, only a spiritual experience will help you. Wow. Only a religious movement or a religious power will help you. And that was the answer. That's funny to say because he did sort of get his act together because he realized I need I need a metaphysical life and a metaphysical and a mystic force to get me going. That's where the the God of your understanding came about. And in fact, the second step, many have uh, corresponded or said it is Jung who came up with it, which is uh, came to believe that a power greater than it's st- than ourselves yeah, could nice restore story. us to sanity. Yeah. Our minds were broken down. And in the Gnostic way, there was one mind. The mind of the alien god was the god that was working. We needed to find the wisdom to start having soundness of thought like the mind of the alien god. So in that way, I think it's very interesting how Gnosticism even ties into uh, the 12 steps. Yeah, and that's a big point with me. I believe that Gnosticism is a way of thinking. Yes, I mean... uh, and this is, of course, you can share that with the, the Hermetics. I mean, they assumed, look, we were a fraction of, uh, as we talked about, the, the Adam, the Adam Cadmon, the man. We were the reflection of this archetypal, archetypal, archetypal perfection beyond the stars that lived there. And it was about calibrating ourselves to that perfection or even to that harmony, that wholeness. Uh, in the Gnostic text, the alien god is often seen as just uh, this perfect mind that's emanating, this light that's flowing out great concepts like imagination and compassion and uh, all these and uh, other you know other great characteristics and we shared in that mind our mind had become broken because it had forgotten its origins and it was a matter of just restoring that thinking that right thinking to get there of course they say and hey you can't think yourself to right action you've got to act yourself you got to act mm-hmm. into right thinking that's correct but that that's where gnosticism is no longer just uh speculative mm-hmm. or uh, philosophical because again part of it are the action instead of going to the 12 to the meetings the gnostics were doing this ecstatic shamanistic uh, rituals that they would do to get out of their minds to take these flights into something greater carl young love him you know I, i've been studying him since i was a teenager Jung is great i've done so many shows on him and I read so much about him, and I take him for the good and the bad. He was a, he was a human. He was a man of his times. So he had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of shortfalls. He had a lot of deficiencies. But again, he was a human. And uh, that's what John Lennon would say. You're just a oh human, a victim he, of the insane. <laughs> yeah, same with John Lennon. People want to judge him for what he did in the '60s, the way he treated Julian and his wife. But he was a very tortured and. Uh, he was a man under a lot of pain, and he needed to escape the world that it, uh, that he thought he wanted, but became a prison for him. And uh, it's uh, so it's interesting. Even recently, I was reading how Carl Jung was uh, OSS agent four eight eight when he worked for uh, for the intelligence against Hitler. And in, in a sort of dark twist, Alan Dulles, the founder of the CIA that's brought so much pain into this world, he was very interested in Jung. His mistress was going to Jung, and basically he was mining information, mining information on how to understand people's psyches, and of course later use them against him. In fact, it was Jung who basically mm-hmm. told him, he said, look, you're never going to take Hitler alive. This is the kind of person that's going to, he's going to kill himself before you get close to him. And people are like, no, no, he's just like any other dictator. He'll he'll try to buy his way out or surrender and live off an island like Napoleon or something like that. And he was like, no. So it's a, in a dark twist of fate. It's even Jung's great gnosis was used, well, was used and then became, used to become a weapon against civilization. Mm-hmm. But yeah, everything, every great discovery is weaponized, it seems. Everything is weaponized, whether it's psychedelics, music. Uh, yes, that is the way this world works. This is the world of the archons. It's going to get weaponized. So and that's for us to uh, always, uh, yeah, it's always... Always good to be aware. I mean, the Internet's been weaponized. It's now a a great source of misinformation and disinformation. It's a great force for totalitarian and group thought. So, But so it is. Nothing has changed. Back to breaking the ego and all the fear that is in that. So, hmm. have you had 
your ego completely stripped? Have you forgotten your name, where you're from? Uh, are you talking like in a positive way or a bad way? In an apotheosis, either one, good or bad. Yes, but uh, these, uh, I think it happens more and more often, but it's not like a great, not this great mystical experience falling off my horse on the road of Damascus or right. under the Bodhi tree. It's those, really those wonderful, I think you keep bringing up an important point, humility, those moments of humility that keep growing when I can just sit there take a sigh of relief and say, I am grateful for what's in front of me. It's not going to last. I am very glad that I can be of use to the universe and of use to man. And those moments really become the most powerful mystic moments because that's when I forget myself and I forget Saturn and I forget mm -hmm. uh, being possessed by Dionysus or anything like that. And those moments grow more and more as time goes on. I guess you could call it I be, I'm becoming wiser and wiser. Exactly. You're evolving. Yes, I hope so, because I spent so much, most of my life devolving, so it was about time I went through the light, like, uh, like well, to the alien god, like in the myths, where Sophia falls from uh, the pleroma, the fullness of the divine, because of her own transgression. Sophia is really one of the, the, one of the first, you know, the myth of Lucifer, probably one of the origins with Sophia, disobeying heaven, or the eternal realm, or the divine mind, falling into this world and then having to uh, fix things and become sort of a trickster deity, a Hermes in herself who helps mankind or children that she created by accident. So in those like, and but at in these points, she turns to the alien God, to the eternal realm, and she confesses, she feels sorry, and she repents, and she becomes more and more powerful as she becomes more and more humble. So I hope like Sophia, I'm doing better. You are. You're definitely evolving. I, I have watched your journey because you are a podcaster. I can keep up with you that way, and I can see the light in your soul growing brighter and brighter. And it shows us you can't be an armchair Gnostic. <laughs> no. you have, Yeah, it's all about getting the experience. That's what it is. I mean, the mind should be with you every step of the way. Things should be logical. Reason should be aware and uh, so forth but at the end of the day is what's that what's that experience that's going to transform you and in a strange way make you godlike but at the same time make you more human indeed because it, it is this, it's a domino effect actually that it makes you more human in which i'm finding out it's a oh my gosh it's like a sending up a boomerang up to heaven and the boomerang coming back and hitting you <laughs> yes yeah and i mean the it's not bad to be human because you realize you've been a robot all your life. I mean, if you're in recovery, I'm sure you know, Core, most of life you probably were like a robot. You were pro not only programmed, but you were doing things you didn't want to do. And in the back of your head, you're going, holy shit, why am I doing this? I am not in control. I'm a machine. And you, as being a human seems... Uh, it really is a great evolution and you can do nice things like humans do, like make the right choices and enjoy the sunset and enjoy the company of other human beings. Yeah, I guess I always had a voice inside that was saner than me saying, look at that sunset and isn't that beautiful and what are all those sparks in the air and why do you see light around your teacher when she's against the chalkboard? So I've always been one of those weird girls. Uh, yes, I think so, too. Of course, through periods of my life, I lost that. And in fact, I only regained it maybe five, six years ago. But for a while, it was just uh, I could in my mind say this is beautiful and this is night and I see a spirit. But it wasn't touching my soul because my soul had been buried so deep within layers of trauma and uh, programming and self-defense and all that. So when you when I let the light shine out, and again, it takes a lot of humility, when I ask help from the universe and those within the universe that are suffering as much as I did, well, then things got better real quick. There you go. I call out for help. That's beautiful. And that's Always, humility. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes. Again, I go to the myth of Sophia. She was, uh, you know, this most uh, supreme of all supreme beings. When she finally humbled herself and called out for help, that's when things, that's when the rescue operation of the universe truly began. It's that next lily pad. You never really know if it's going to be there, but you jump 
anyway because you trust God. And in my vision, God is you envision God. <laughs> exactly. A God of our own understanding. Everything's yes. going to be okay. <laughs> yes. Also, in Buddhism, there is a term called crazy wisdom, which goes straight back to trickster area. And the trickster sometimes is Kalima or Sekhmet that's going to eat you alive. In fact, to destroy the ego, to break the ego, like breaking the glass darkly, you've got to break that glass. And you have to have some kind of oomph behind it, some kind of wimpy, oh, I hope this happens, isn't going to work. you got to have passion, <laughs> right? Yes, very much. I mean, I mentioned how Sophia is almost like a predator. She's also a, some as others, some scholars have noted, she is a trickster deity. She's a helper of mankind, but she also tends to be very um, hysterical, almost schizophrenic. Yeah. She breaks up into different places and appears into different scenes in Austic tales, almost like the Cheshire Cat exactly. in different incarnate. You know, one minute she's Eve, the other minute she's the seductive Mary Magdalene, and the other she's a, an angel. So she has split herself all over the universe in her attempt, and it seems like she's tricking, but like you said, at the end of the day, she's trying to break all the norms of the universe, the the stale, law-filled structure of the universe, which in many ways symbolizes our own ego. Indeed, and nature always breaks through the cement, doesn't it? Yes, unless, of course, nature is part of the cement. <clears throat> Who knows? Because I I'm, think I'm a Gnostic pagan. Tech... <laughs> so. Well, the pagans weren't very fond of nature either. I think I think the key is, is like anything, uh, if we humans are light and darkness, well, so is the tree, so is the cat, so is the stone. I mean, there was like the Gnostic Manichaeans used to say, uh, God is in every blade of grass. I mean, they used to pray to the trees and they wouldn't take fruit from the trees. They waited till the fruit fell from the ground. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't walk on grass because they thought they were torturing God. And then there's they the were, Jains who Yeah, were they mouth. were very much like the Jains, except they were a Western version mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they they also knew that the devil was also there. There was a darkness in there that was trapping the light. There was the predator. There was the, the temporality of nature. There was the dark side of it. And they loved nature as a whole, but the, the, their goal was to bring out the light from nature. That's amazing. I have literally never seen the dark side of nature. You just pointed it out to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure nature, I mean, if, if all life is suffering, then everything is suffering. So everything deserves compassion. I mean, the Manichaeans would say that the rock deserves our compassion. The oh, tree. I agree. I agree, but if deserves. you drop me in the middle of the woods, I'm like, okay, I'm in heaven because I'm alone. <laughs> yeah, I would, see, I, I, I'm not like, I, I would say, well, does anybody need help? What's suffering? What needs prayer? What needs meditation? What, uh. What is the good and what is it? What is temporal? What's eternal? How can I how can I be part of the rescue operation and so forth? Something like that. And I do understand that also as a thought loop. As a thought loop? Yeah, it's a train that keeps going around the same track. So no matter where you are, you've got the same train on the same track. How can I help? How can I reach out? How can I? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. That makes I? sense. Yeah, how can I help? I mean, that's what they always say, even in Alcoholics Anonymous. How am I going to be of service? I but mean, that's beautiful, the masculine. You know, what they, whether I'm going to a wedding or I'm going out into the woods or I'm walking down on a street, is how can I be of help to anything? Yeah, and that in its nature is the masculine projective. So you can see that you're living mostly in, in accordance with the masculine projective. Oh, well, that makes sense. How do I get into the fem the feminine then? Right. The so anima, you are still uh, you. partially, <laughs> yeah, the anima animus, you're still partially, in my opinion, blaming the feminine. <laughs> but you uh -huh. are within feminine, and you are healing your inner feminine as we speak. Ah, well, interesting. Well, good. At least I'm, I hope I'm on the right step, not off a cliff. No, you're 100. No, there's no more cliffs for you, my friend. The white dog <laughs> has gone away, and we have replaced it with snakes. Oh, don't say that because one of my animal guides is a white wolf. In fact, uh, both in my <laughs> in my dream and in the material world, a white wolf saved my life. So, uh, <laughs> but, wow. but you didn't know that. So. No, of course not. Um, the white wolf is very powerful. 
I have seen him as of late in the past year in dreams, and I saw actually a man wearing a wolf on his head down at Venice Beach, if you believe it or not, dressed oh, like wow. a shaman. Freaked me out, right? I would have freaked out. Right? Yes. I was like, oh my God, no, sis, right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I had just dreamt about two wolves coming to save me. Wow, that's good. Yes, powerful, powerful symbol, powerful uh Entity spirit. Yeah, so the white dog and Cliff, we are obviously talking about the full card. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Then I I get it. Yes, so that's what the serious dog will always be with you. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. Now I understand, yes. When once I got away from ceremonial magic and all that and started being more of a trend one on one side a transcendental person. But on the other side, a sort of good right action person. I just uh, I got away from tarot and all that stuff. But it, I know it's still valuable for people. It's great stuff. Sure, I use tarot not as a high magician through the Kabbalah, but as a counselor. How could I help? That was my masculine projective. Ah, okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, but I only really help people. The plants and everything seem cool. Well, <laughs> the oceans are not cool. Actually, I have been made well aware of that. Why don't you think they're cool? I got a transmission about 10 years ago that everything was going to change and get like um, apocalyptic, so to speak, in my reality, as in our reality, as there were not enough fish. Mm, well, I think we are in the middle of an apocalypse, mm -hmm. not in the traditional Christian sense, but the revealing. Yes, there, is, there is a huge revealing and uh, if well, if you don't notice it, uh, things are going to go bad. Yeah, it b bad funny too. I mean, it all depends on your perspective. I believe because I've talked to you, it's such a gift that I understand the four twins of Egypt, and then we got the the trinity, the trinity, and I believe these are different mental realms almost where my story is a different story and I have a different perspective on nature and many other things of the cosmos and then we have your story which Gnosticism I'm just you're an expert man this is your story okay take credit for it <laughs> who knows maybe you wrote it in a past life you know yeah yeah no I'm no expert I'm just uh trying to use the full potential of what has been given to me but uh, there are a lot of great minds out there in different fields definitely a lot of great minds in the gnostic field and they're just not they're more than scholars they're they're great practitioners and they know what they're doing and they're they're doing good work you bring them to the fire and you have enough knowledge the fire i mean the campfire to speak and you have enough knowledge to ask the right questions no, well, thank you, thank you. I mean, like anything, it's having passion for what you like. I mean, I'm, even after 11 years, I'm still just, uh, I feel like I'm a babe and I want to learn more about these wonderful guests. And I feel that all these people who have written books and had experience, they have so much to share to the world. They're part of the puzzle to put together of this sort of, again, alt-media mm -hmm. thing that we're putting out to break the monolithic media that is keeping humanity asleep at the wheel. So, and you're doing the same thing. I'm sure, I'm sure you're having a blast half of the time with your guests because you're you're doing what you wanted to do, which is learn and share. Yeah, the secret I think of the podcasters that we're big fanboys. We love the authors. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we want and, and uh, we want to give people a chance to say their piece because. A lot of our guests probably won't get a chance anywhere else, and they deserve to be heard. Yeah, they're really, they get lost in academia so often. Exactly, exactly. Couldn't mm -hmm. agree more. You're bringing it to the street. <laughs> Taking it to the street like the Dewey Brothers. Exactly. You're a street poet, man. <laughs> and I'm in the basement cooking up the medicine. That's me. <laughs> the cauldron. <laughs> I was listening to your podcast in anticipation of this amazing interview with you, and I learned that you used to be an alcoholic, that you are now currently a recovering alcoholic who's been through 12-step, and I would love for you to share some of your wisdom, what you have learned, <coughs> and how you have healed through this process, and, and where you are today with it, and how you can to help others, to assist others who are going through that dark night. Well, as mentioned, uh, there is uh, 
a lot of esotericism in the 12 steps and in Alcoholics Anonymous. I think uh, Bill W. pulled from the wisdom of the ages around him. Again, as mentioned, Jung is influential, but so is William James. So is St. Francis of Assisi when talking about Christian mysticism. So AA was, uh, for my personality, somebody who's always traveled in, you might say, occult uh, circles. It worked really well because it was all there. But of course, the great thing about AA for me was that it sort of focused on that one sin of mine, which was uh, the alcohol and the drugs and the codependence and the whole inflamed ego thing. It got directly to the issue. But as we talked um, with the idea of Sophia, it was really about uh, the repentance and the humbling yourself, the being open-minded and turning to the light that really helped me. I mean, there is, uh, jo- Joseph Campbell always talked about uh, the the key to enlightenment or individuation or whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, was becoming transparent to the transcendent, to become open-minded, to becoming honest, to to find a way where those energies will flow through you and in a way make your ego lighter and make your higher mind stronger. There's yeah, a passage to have no in, secrets within. No secrets right. within. You're only as sick as your secrets, as they say. Wow. And uh, there's a passage in a Gnostic text called the Dialogue of the Savior. And uh, Mary Magdalene has just received the mysteries of Jesus. And she says, to the cosmic, I have become transparent. Mm. It's one of my favorite lines in probably all Gnostic writings because I get it. She had become open where all the energies flowed through her, where she could see everything. I mean, they always say in another text, they call Mary Magdalene the woman who understood the all. She understood everything perfectly. So what does that have to do with recovery? Well, that is recovery because in Gnosticism, we are all asleep. Our divine spark is buried. And the same principles that uh, drive AA, in a way, drive Gnosis. Uh, and we've, we've already covered them, which is humility, an open mind is, and a desire to experience and a desire to take action to find the action that works for you, as they say, the God of your under, your own understanding. So all those really work well. And as, again, as we talked about before, it's all about asking for help. We talked about Sophia, who turned towards the light and asked for help, or Paul and his insanity, and he needed light from, he needed help from the from the mind of Christ and so forth. And that's very important, you know, if when you are ready, the master will come. So I think that the idea of an open mind is the idea of asking for help and as much humility and honesty as possible. Those are great recipes, whether you're an alcoholic or a seeker of higher spiritual truths, it works well. So um, these things have worked well in all my uh, in all my journeys, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it's AA or you're going down to the mosque or you're going down to the temple, what you put in, you are going to get out. And putting something in, investing yourself into something that's greater than yourself, it's a lot harder than most people think. At least it was for me because I wouldn't, I didn't want to do it most of my life. Carl Jung himself said uh, that the collective unconscious your unconscious the part of you that is called the self it's not going to just come at you like a morpheus in the matrix and give you a pill you have to make that turning towards the light you have to make the first journey and it is scary it's what campbell said going down into the cave with the dragon but if you ask for help and you go into that journey to finding something greater than yourself you are going to hit the treasures and that's something that i finally had to do in my journey so i'm very glad to be sober and very glad that i've been in recovery and i and nothing is still easy i think at the beginning of the interview we talked about how when you awake, the universe will test you over and over again. In the Gnosticism, it's a negative thing. The angels and the archons see that you're awake and they must punish you. In other forms of spirituality, is something you might say, it's a testing of you. I think in the original story, Satan was not a negative figure in the Bible. He was just the part of God that wanted to test your faith, test your humility. Test your so metal. Things, yes, exactly. Or even... Uh, even uh, Typhon in the Egyptian uh, set, in the Egyptian myths. He's not really negative. He is the part that's testing 
testing. He's the force that is always testing the universe, always trying to push things back and put things into chaos. But it's not a negative thing. But either way, things are not have not gotten easy, but they're a lot better. And I do definitely see the light uh, much clearer these days. I hope I hope that was okay. I kind of got went here and there and everywhere else. Well, that's all the teaching. You got to be circular like that <laughs> <laughs> yes yes well, we were talking about how ancient men didn't see anything in a straight path mm-hmm. yeah it's all twisty turvy and even rabbit <laughs> holes they don't go in one direction yes i'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes morpheus said in the matrix and that's what it is yeah so i'm curious were you able to find the root cause personally of your alcoholism through these methods the root cause that is a good question i would assume it's it's every it's the same old it's fear it's fear of change it's fear of growth it's fear of uh taking that step into the unknown i mean that's mm -hmm. what drives uh that's something that seems to drive humans certainly drive me at the end of the day it's fear and fear made me want to sell out Fear wanted me to put on masks that really weren't me. Fear wanted me to not take any uh, any journeys again into the great unknown or take a take that leap of faith into other things. Fear wanted me to hoard. Fear wanted me to lie, and fear wanted me to just uh, be the lesser version of myself. So that's a start right there. Very powerful, very timely. I know someone just heard that and really needed to hear it. I could feel yeah. it. Yeah, and as quirky as it sounds, I always like what they say in AA. Fear is just an acronym for false evidence appearing as real. I love because, that. Because uh, what is real, we know what's real. It's what what is divine, what is holy, and what is good out there. And we know it's there, but we have this thing of uh, tricking ourselves. Mm. And isn't it also true that you kind of have to almost relive your childhood through a new perspective to find the root causes? Oh, bingo, bingo. I mean, I always like this uh this saying well the saying is it's a famous saying and it goes it's never too late to have a happy childhood mm. so there are other ways you can go back into the past and see things with a completely different perspective and that takes a lot of introspection meditation and sometimes a lot of therapy but there are some wonderful things even scenes that i think are traumatic in my life that sort of uh switch that turn on the switch to darker things if i can go back and see the perspective of that person or that situation with full forgiveness, sometimes I can actually see a completely different scene. I see different people in the room. I see the forces that were happening that made it happen and they're not they weren't negative. I see the ideas of people and I suddenly see, wow. This was really good stuff. And I think that's that's one thing I know in our society we're sort of conditioned, well, the past is in the past and live in the present and all <laughs> that stuff. But, I mean, if there's one thing the Gnostics were obsessed with was the past because they felt the universe was in a trauma. Again, it was in a state of suffering. And if they went to the past of the gods and their heroes and the, the, the history of humanity, they could find some wonderful gems and perspectives and new ideas and so forth. And uh, I think we must journey to the past because, uh, again, there is a chance we will have a great childhood again. Mm -hmm. And peak experiences, people usually think peak experience, peak means good, good, ex highly good experiences. It's not true. Trauma is also a peak experience. Yes, yes, and even your bad memories, as a young and scholar told me, they have as much right to be in my head as the good memories. I mean, they are part of me, they have value, they're part of the shadow, and they have wonderful wisdom and lessons to teach me. And so if I can just watch them float over me and embrace them, I embrace the wounded child of the past, and there's a lot of healing there. And as you and said, forgiveness. yeah, and treasure, Pluto's, mm -hmm. Hades, treasure, right? Exactly, exactly, yes. When we get symbolical, again, it's finding that scary dragon and the treasure and all that that Campbell and Jung wrote about. And uh, again, and of course, there needs to be a lot of forgiveness. And I, I mean, there was a, a friend of mine, very Gnostic-minded, and he talked about, 
he was telling me about uh, before his father-in-law, his stepfather died. His stepfather had traumatized him as a kid, brutal to him. Mm. He went on his deathbed and, and <laughs> as, a, as an adult and he said, please forgive me. And he didn't know why he did it. I mean, if, if anybody, it should be the other way around. But when he took that position, it suddenly he was completely free of everything. He saw the humanity in his stepfather and the humanity in the situation, and he was free. And at the end of the day, I would say that's, that's really the thrust of AA or Gnosis, mm-hmm. is to become free, to become pretty much liberated from the past, from the present, and even the future. No more linear time. You mm-hmm. are free, free of fate. Is there anything you would like to say to our audience? No, I love to say if anybody's interested in my work, go to the God above God dot com and you'll find uh, books, podcasts, articles, uh, videos and all this other wonderful heresy to really uh, get a good foothold on the whole Gnostic idea. This has been a joy. Hermes wants you to read The Divine Pymander again, but The Divine Pymander, to me, is talking about the, th- the veils of darkness and coming down in through fascination because you're fascinated with the earth, and it's kind of a good thing and not a bad thing. Oh, well, thank you. I'll definitely do it. It's on my list now. Great. And it's, it's not that long. It's pretty easy. Yeah, in is. fact, young, not young, wow, um, Manly P. Hall did a great lecture, hour and a half on it, on YouTube. Oh, wow. Oh, i got to check it out. It's wonderful. Love Manly. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> Great. This was wonderful. You're just just a star. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it a lot. <sighs> I'll talk to you anytime. Even if you got issues or whatever, I am a counselor. So. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. How about a tarot? <laughs> yeah, dude. You, would you like to do that? Yes, I would. <laughs> totally. Okay. I will get a hold of you this week and we'll figure that out.